Okay, so, hello everybody. Um, yeah, we're going to the next one. A little bit delayed here, but sorry for that, but we finally got it all fixed. Okay, so um, the three of us, the three of us will talk a little bit of the different IoT protocols and Mac layers we already have in the kernel, and uh, one actually that's going to be proposed to be um, upstreamed at some point. And yeah, a little bit about the an update on what's going on since the last year we, we talked about that. So the agenda would be just a short introduction of what's going on here. Um, then Jian Hong will talk about the LoRaWAN um, subsystem he's working on and planning to upstream. Um, I will give a little bit of an overview of what has been happening in 15.4 and 6 Lopen, the subsystems I maintain together with Alexander. Um, then Alex will talk about of different problems we have with multiple interface handling and this kind of subsystems and uh, exposing the MAC header information um, through IP version 6 headers uh, socket layer because some of the applications might need information coming from there. Um, then we had a situation where we run into a huge regression in the IPv6 fragmentation handling for our subsystem, and that really wasn't kind of an eye-opener for us that we need more testing there, so I've been spending a little bit of time thinking about it and what we can and what we should do about that. And then we have some topics for discussion in the end. This whole thing should be around one and a half hour. The longest uh, item would be the lower one subsystem talk from John, and the other ones are like mostly like 10 minutes things or so. so this should be really interactive, so if you have questions or something, just go up, talk to us. It's not like you're standing here presenting and you just listen, but really just bring it up. So that's the second one we do in this kind of workshop. The first one was at uh, NetF uh, 2.1, also in Montreal. Um, we sadly had to skip 2.2. Um, it still feels a bit strange to have this kind of topic here because all the other things you see on the schedule is really mostly about high performance, something like eBPF, XDP, hardware offloading and stuff like that. And we are really very different scope here. But anyway, um, we got, fe got, got feedback from the uh, organizers that this kind of topic is interesting for the people here, so we keep going with that for a while. And yeah, just a few words on what the scope is here from what we think. Um, so all this IoT thing is a huge buzzword area, obviously. Um, there's a lot of vendor-specific solutions, and what we try here is really to avoid most of these things and really try to stay with the public specifications that are available that can be used, be it ISA, ITF, IEEE, or just some open specs that are just available for the developers. And well, in the end, we really try to something like bring IP version 6 down to the sensor and have everything going that way. Okay, so that would be just the introduction, and I will hand over to Jiang Hon to talk about the Lower One class module. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm Pan Jiang Hon, and uh, I come from Taiwan and works in uh, Endless Mobile now. And you can find me or get the slide from the stage here, uh, maybe after. And uh, Taiwan grows many good uh, grains, vegetables, uh, fruits, from something like that, a lot of things. Yeah, uh, so there are a lot of farmers who want to uh, make sh uh, our fruit, uh, food more nature and uh, less chemical things. So my, one of my friends, he is a farmer called Xing Yan. Uh, he is also a maker in the farm. Uh, he had made a, a sensing system uh, for the uh, atmosphere and uh, the water level in the farm. Another example is the location aware sensing system, the last. The most uh, famous project is the air box, uh, which can measure the air pollution, the, uh, for example, a PN 2.5. And all of those end devices are deployed into the uh, wide and the wild area. Uh, they use the wireless communication to uh, the gateway, and then gateway propagate the data to the internet, uh, to the backend server, something like that. So the transmit, uh, com wireless communication distance is very important for those kind of devices. Uh, we can use the 3G, 4G, 5G, or uh, IEEE, AO2, 15, 4, um, and devices. Or we can choose uh, another kind of things like uh, low power uh, wireless area network. Uh, and the low is one of the that, that uh, technology implemented. Um, 
we always want our uh, communication is low power and high speed and uh, long range. But it's a bargain. There's no overlap area in uh, between three of them. We can most choose of two of them. And the low power wide area network choose the low power and the long transmit range. Uh, LoRa is a physical layer uh, in the internet, uh, not the traditional internet. Uh, it uses chirp spread spectrum radio modulation, and it has good link budget, uh, but with low data rate. Um, it could works uh, be uh, uh, works with quite a low power consumption. Uh, link budget is the difference uh, uh, between the transmission and the receiving antenna. If if you have a bigger link budget, then you can transmit your signal more distance. And here's the lower physical uh, uh, message format. Uh, it's a, uh, because it's a wireless uh, communication, so it has the preamble and the uh, phi header and the checksum for the header, uh, a physical header, and the phi payload and then checksum for the phi payload. And back to the actual EL 254 um, it has uh, good topologies. Uh, for example, the star topology peer-to-peer, -peer, which can form a set of mesh, or uh, combine two of them become a cluster tree network. Um, we can extend the coverage by uh, more branches. If we can combine two advantages of them, the cluster tree network of, of IEEE L2154 and uh, the good link budget of the LoRa, together like this, uh, LoRa X and IEEE L215 for physical layer for the uh, uh, for the communication. Then we can have a bigger uh, coverage area but less nodes, which means uh, we can get more coverage and, but uh, less money for the end devices. Uh, I have done this uh, last year and uh, do the experiment. I use two Raspberry Pi and uh, two transceiver. They can communicate with each other. And uh, I have put the code and on the GitHub. The LoRa transceiver module I choose is the Syntec chips. Um, it has the 168 decibel maximum uh, link budget and uh, high sens sensitivity, which down to a uh, minus 148 dBm. That means uh, you can tra transmit your various signals under the noise. Uh, the noise can be bigger than your signals. Um, it's interesting. And uh, I also listed the, uh, its working frequency range. This is the actual picture I take before uh, when I'm doing the experiment. Uh, if you want more detail about that, you can go to the hyperlink and uh, get more uh, information. However, the IEEE L2154 over raw file cannot communicate with the original IEEE L2154 devices be uh, because they are different file layers. Uh, the most important is they work um, in different uh, frequency range. So how about a new class module or substitute for LoRa devices? Uh, LoRa one is a um, back layer over the LoRa physical devices. Um, it defines the star. Uh, it uses the star topology, so it has an uh, uplink and uh, downlink messages. Uh, it can uh, works over LoRa or F FSK mode. Uh, it also uh, has three classes: class A, B, C. The like class A is the baseline, and it uses Aloha protocol. Um, the most important thing is uh, the end device, which is. Uh, which is the transceiver. Transceiver. Um, it only wakes up when it transmit, uh, transmitting or receiving. The other time, the class A and device should go to sleep or idle or standby mode, which can save a lot of energy. Uh, class B is the works in beacon mode, and the class C is the uh, works in continuous mode. Both class B and C should also implement the class A features. And here, uh, here comes more detail about the timing slot. Um, at first, 
and the end device, which is, is the maybe not the one, transmit uh, a blank message to the uh, uh, network server via gateway, LoRa when gateway, and uh, the gateway only do one things, which is uh, become a forwarder. Okay, and uh, the network server could be in the cloud or same in the uh, same with the gateway in the same box. Uh, the end device transmit uh, time on the air, and then end device go to sleep or idle or standby for delay time, and then we call it delay one now. And then after that, uh, the end device open a receiving window. We call it RX one, and uh, the network server can send a downlink message to the end device in the uh, receiving window. If network device, uh, if network server uh, miss the time, or or end device did not get the downlink message, that's okay because end device will uh, delay another time, uh, which we call the delay two. And then after delay two, end device will open another receiving window. We call it RX two. Network server can. Uh, Send a downlink message to uh, also in the um, uh, receiving window too. Uh, if end device get the uh, receive uh, downlink message in the receiving window one, then end device will not open another receiving window uh, two. You may curiosity about uh, how long should the delay time uh, it should be. Uh, if the end device works in uh, North America, then it should be in uh, 902 to 92 a megahertz. And uh, the, the, these parameters are documented on the Aurora Wins Regional Parameters documentation. And for this example, uh, the receive delay one should be one second, and the uh, receive delay two should be two seconds. If it is an uh, activation procedure, then a join accept delay one is five seconds, and the join accept delay two is six seconds. And uh, you may also curiosity, curiosity about the data rate. Um, this also be documented on the uh, LoRaWAN regional parameters documentation. If you choose the data rate zero, then this end device should works with uh, LoRa mode and uh, the spreading factor is 10 and the bandwidth is 125 kilohertz. And we can convert it, this uh, to the bit rate which is uh, 980 bits per second. And here's the uh, make data message format for uh, uplink and downlink. Uh, the make message should be placed in the file payload and uh, it begins with the MAC header, which is one byte. And the uh, MAC payload uh, with um, M bytes, and then check sum. And uh, the MAC payload can split into three fields, the frame header and the port field and uh, the frame payload. The frame payload is the real message you want to send. And uh, uh, the maximum uh, length of uh, for a Mac payload and the frame payload, which is M and N, if you choose the data rate zero, then the maximum uh, Mac payload length will be uh, 19 bytes, and the frame payload's maximum length will be 11 bytes. It's quite slow. And the Mac header, the first byte of the Mac, uh, Mac message is a uh, message type. It could be uh, join, or request, or accept, or unconfirmed data up or down, confirmed data up or down. The confirmed and uh, unconfirmed, uh, the difference between unconfirmed and then confirmed is uh, this uh, Mac data message should be act or not. Here's the friend header of the Mac message. Uh, the first four bytes is the device address, and the one byte is for a control byte, and the two bytes for a frame counter, and uh, then the frame options. Uh, for operating frames, 
uh, the first bit is the depth data rate request bit. Uh, and then the sixth bit is the adaptive data rate re act request. And the fifth bit is the act bit for the confirmed data. And then the last four bits is for uh, indicates the length of the frame options field. Each end device should hold two frame counters, which is frame counter up and down. Uh, for uplink and downlink. And the frame counter uh, is, incre is incremented only uh, if the confirmed data is X. And the port field is used for the, uh, uh, if, uh, if the payload is not empty. Uh, if the port field is zero, then it means there's a piggyback the, uh, MAC command. Uh, for the uh, uh, netting layer. If the value is 1 to 223, it's for uh, user application specific. Um, the main command can be piggybacked in the frame options field or send us a separate data frame uh, in the frame payload. When uh, it is a uh, separate data frame in the frame payload, then the F port must be set to zero. Um, for the communication between the uh, end device and the network server, they both hold uh, three keys. Uh, one is the application key, and the network session key, and the application session key. Uh, at first, uh, if the end device is not activated, and we can activate the end device by two ways. It's one is the over the air, the other one is the personalization. If you choose the personalization, which means um, end devices and the network server already set uh, the end device device address and the network session key and the application session key. If you choose uh, the first one over the air, then uh, the end device uh, send a join request message to the network server, and the join request contain the application UI, EUI, and the device UI. Network server get the information and uh, accept the request. It will send back to the end device with the join accept message. The join accept message is um, encrypted with the application key. And because end device and the network server both have the end application key, so they can do that uh, encryption and decryption. And then both of them uh, derivated the application session key and network session key by themselves with the application key. And uh, here is the um, uh, frame, uh, Mac format of the uh, joiners join request and uh, accept a message. And uh, after that, uh, we can uh, start to have our uh, LoRa and the LoRaWAN subsystem now. Um, for my idea, uh, I want to have a LoRaWAN cast module. And uh, it provides the LoRa device interfaces for LoRa device drivers. Mm, for example, uh, I will talk about later the fake LoRa and uh, for uh, same tech chip like uh, SX1276 or 7989, like that. And uh, it also provides uh, um, MacLeod end devices act as an network devices, which means um, the LoRa when cast module make the uh, device driver as a network devices, device driver. So user space can uh, use the socket API directly and then do the communication as the previous uh, programs. Um, I have put the class module on the GitHub, but this is temporary URL and uh, will be moved in the future. And uh, first, uh, I focus on LoRaWAN version 102 and the class A device now because it's simplest and uh, more features will be added in the future. 
um, to make uh, uh, a LoRa devices act as a network device. So I have imp uh, implemented the uh, UTP protocols for the uh, for LoRa WAN class module, and uh, also um, and also uh, try to do some uh, IO control for that. And uh, for the LoRa device drivers, um, I also provide the uh, header files, uh, the structure, uh, LoRa hardware structure, and uh, the operations. For example, the start and the stop operation is just uh, like uh, start a LoRa hardware or stop LoRa hardware, and uh, tra uh, synchronous transmit and uh, set the transmit power, frequency bandwidth, and working mode. Um, working mode and the spreading factor, something like that. And uh, uh, because we have said uh, any device should open the receive window, then how to re uh, how to open the receive window should be implemented in uh, device driver. So I also provided the operations interface, which is the starter RX window. And uh, allocated uh, LoRa hardware free uh, LoRa hardware, reduced, unreduced, something like that. And uh, here's the uh, private structures for the LoRa win. Uh, basically, uh, it's for the uh, most uh, configuration and uh, the three keys, application key, network session key, application session key. And um, uh, I also implemented the timing slot of the transmit and the receiving, a uh, two receiving window. So there's a LoRa session structure for that. Uh, I also uh, draw this state machine picture. At first, uh, Lo when the LoRa uh, when session uh, is uh, initiated, is in the initiated mode, and uh, transmit transmitting, and then transmitted, which means uh, a device uh, or the transceiver module transmitted the uh, uplink data message. And then after the delay time, it opens the receiving window one and two. If any device or transceiver, transceiver got the uh, downlink message, then it will turn, uh, this LoRa station will turn into the receive state. If it is not, then it will go to the time out state. And uh, it also have a mechanism for retransmit. And I also implemented the crypto module uh, for the trans uh, transmit mission uh, because uh, for general um, transmission, the MAC data, sh uh, the frame payload of the MAC message should be encrypted uh, with the application session key or network session key. It's, go uh, it's according to the um, it, this make message is for make command or not make command. I mean, uh, user space specific. So when you use uh, um, if it, if this make make message is for uh, make command, then it um, then the frame pedal should be encrypt, encrypted with the uh, network session key. If it is not for a make make command, it should be encrypted with the uh, application session key. And there's a lot of something, uh, a lot of things to be done. For example, the activation, configuration, uh, refer to the uh, uh, regional parameters documentation, and uh, IO control, and uh, make comments over the over a negative layer and the documentation, and uh, also user space utilities like um, config activation, and uh, finally connect to the network server via the real gateway. And uh, for uh, verify what I have done, I have dry, uh, write a uh, fake LoRa driver. Uh, it's a simple dummy LoRa device driver for LoRaWAN. And I use it to verify like LoRaWAN class module I, I wrote. And it could be the template in the future. And uh, 
someone uh, like Andres also doing something like that. Uh, he has sent this patch set, uh, which is uh, uh, a socket API for Rora. Um, mo most of the uh, patches is about the uh, Rora device drivers, not the Rora one. So uh, we have discussed on the mailing list. Uh, Rora one class module uh, need the com compatible Rora one uh, Rora device drivers, which means. Um, it's great to see someone um, ha has already done the, eh, not done, uh, doing, he's doing uh, LoRa device drivers. Not finished yet, but hope, uh, I hope there's, uh, we'll, more, uh, we'll, we'll have more uh, LoRa device drivers in the future. Um, just Hello? Um, I just had another mail with Andreas about that. So I think one of the important things here is that we make sure that the separation between the um, the file stuff he's working on on all the different drivers on the file layer is really um, there's a good separation between that work and the work you're doing on the lower van because um, the file things can be used with different Mac layers like you did for example with the 15.4 and there's also something like Radio Shuttle and, and other up layers, uh, upper layers that are more interested in not using the stop topology approach lower van is using, but something different there. So we need to keep in mind there that we might want to use this file layers and drivers and everything with different Mac layers on top. So that just something to keep in mind in the discussion you have with them. So yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And um, I already, uh, I have, I have tested uh, the code uh, with the uh, Raspberry Pi, and uh, and I put the uh, LoRaWAN class module on uh, with the path net slash LoRaWAN and the uh, uh, LoRa device drivers under the drivers net LoRaWAN directory, and also uh, I also have a. Registered by myself, the uh, PF Laura went and the address family Laura went, something like that. Macros. And uh, this is the picture I take. Uh, for example, uh, I have uh, I registered a fake Laura device driver, and uh, it present as a Laura zero in, uh, network interface, and uh, it, the NTU could be set. And uh, I also write uh, the send program and send a test string and uh, got some message under that. And here's my reference. And uh, yeah, this is a nice view uh, of the Taipei city. I take it from Elephant Mountain. The tallest building is the Taipei 101. Uh, it had been the tallest building in the world before. So if we can put a lower wing gateway on top of it, then we can have and uh, we can gain a big coverage. Uh, but it's joking because I cannot afford for rent, for the rent. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, are you open to taking taking the questions now? Yeah. All right. So as I understand, you mentioned uh, at the file layer you have LoRa. At the Mac layer, you are putting 802.15.4. And I'm assuming that the compression that you are trying to make use of is 6 low pan on top of it. But then I what I, what I was expecting to hear from the LoRa, uh, uh, LoRa van, this thing is to make use of Schick compression rather than 6 low pan compression. Is Schick, uh, the LP1 working group is working towards it, the ETF working group. If I, can answer, Rat, yeah. if I can answer on that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it really depends on what kind of Mac you, least, uh, you use on top of the Fi. So, if you go ahead and use 15.4, 6 low pen with all the adaptions there might make sense. I mean, depending a bit on the on the address size and so on. But if you go directly with lower van, then something like that static uh, context header compression or something like that that is worked on, on ITF might make sense. In my slides, I will have a, a, um, a comment on that as well. So that could be another module being implemented in the framework we have for header compression like 6 low pen. There could be another module for static, uh, static context or something. There's nobody as far as I know working on it, but that might be something interesting there. Because I mean, just 
you have so much context there. If you have a star topology, you can um, have just a few bytes in uh, transmitting all the context there. But as I said, as far as, far as I know, nobody is working on that yet. So I, I think I think there are a set of people working on that uh, in IT okay. Hackathon. Uh, you'll see the the people there working on on the shake impl implementation on on uh, the Linux side or some something else. No, no, it's not the Linux side, but it can be adapted to. Uh, yeah, Linux yeah, okay, also. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. I mean. What I meant was more like an implementation on the learning side. So obviously there are people on ITF working on it. There are people working on it on, on different IoT operating systems uh, that, are, that are more suitable for smaller devices and stuff like that. They have, they're doing the implementations there, but not, no, start again. Nobody I know working on the learning side. That is what I meant, sorry. Okay, well, I, I, another question in context to like using 802.15.4 Mac layer on LoRa uh, physical layer, so there are some constraints with regards to act timing, the uh, the address length, the extended ad address length is almost, uh, is eight bytes, uh, so 16 bytes MTU, uh, at least you need to support. So, I, I mean, there are a lot of restrictions that come when you want to support Mac Mac layer of 802.15.4 and LoRa 1 physical layer. So, you know, I, I mean, frankly speaking, what, I, what, what I'm trying to say is if Shik works, then essentially, the, is there any reason why anyone would want to go with this kind of approach? I mean, maybe John Hong had some idea about the 15.4 because I never use 15.4 on top of a different file layer. Um, I just think that for some people, it makes a lot of sense to have a start topology, especially with something like low range, uh, long range uh, type of protocols and stuff like that. But for some, not. I mean, there, there are reasons why something like Radio Shuttle gets developed and so on, because they want to have different peer to peer communication ideas or like maybe even mesh networking. I mean, that's difficult with the kind of MTU size you have here. I, I agree on that. But I mean, some people just want to do some research in this area. But in general, going with LoRaWAN might be the best option for the most people here. But I mean, if you have an, an option on the, um, so you did some research on using 15.4 on, on the Phi. So if you have something to say about that. Uh, yeah, I have done that. But uh, uh, for example, the buffer on the chip is only, for example, the Simtex chip is only uh, 256 bytes on the chip. And the transmission takes the time because uh, the physical problem, yeah. so. But they can communication with the same transceiver, uh, and the take uh, get gain the distance uh, advantage. Um, but actually, uh, there are, uh, there there are some uh, companies done the same things before, uh, but it's a proprietary protocol or drivers. So. Uh, to be in a uh, uh, Linux kernel, then <laughs> this is a problem. So uh, for a kernel, it should be a generic solution for that. So um, so I start to uh, start the Rawan again and uh, re-implement it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I mean, just um, even for 15.4 transceivers, it's sometimes hard if they don't have like automatic act transmission in the hardware or something. Going ahead and doing that in software is something I will also bring up on the slides later. Uh, but that's something that might be difficult from the timing requirements. It might be possible to do in 95% of the time, but if the kernel has something else to do right now, it might just not be possible to, to meet the timing requirements. Then. And that might be even more complicated on lower. Um, but it really depends on what kind of needs you have for your network. I mean, as I said, most people that choose LoRa would definitely go with LoRaWAN. And um, if they want to have something else or just want to experiment or something, we should leave the door open. That is why I mentioned that we should make sure that the file layer and driver implementations we do here is in a way abstracted that it's not bound completely to LoRaWAN but can be used with different Macs and, and other things on top of that. Any more questions on the Laura side here? Okay, so we'll switch to the next topic here. Thank you. Okay, so just a little bit of an update on what happened on the 15.04 and 6 Lopen. Um, kernel subsystems over the last year, basically. So I listed it up by, by kernel releases here. 
It hasn't happened too much, I have to say, sadly, because mostly Alexander and myself have been yeah, doing other things, having not that much spare time to spend on this project. But we did some, at least we kept up on what's going on on patches, get, get submitted to us, we reviewed them, get them in, into the kernel and stuff like that. But not like we did not really have time to develop new features that much. So with, starting with 4.12, we got a new driver for the CA8210 uh, transceiver, which is actually a hard Mac transceiver. But because we don't really have the infrastructure right now in the subsystem to run hard Mac transceivers, they did an implementation in software, which has some um, problems, I would say, depending on the, on the context you have there. Right now, it, it's working fine, but um, really depending on the packets you're sending out there, that might get you into trouble. So we really need to think about um, to enhance the uh, subsystem we have there to allow them to have a hard Mac transceiver driver. But that's something that is quite big actually to tackle. And um, yeah, we need to just have the time for to think about how we do that correctly. Um, there was also a problem with the address uh, length handling in the Bluetooth low energy um, part for 6 low pan that was fixed in that release. Um, in 4.13, there was really nothing much, just a few bug fixes here and there for the drivers mostly. Um, again, in 4.14, also a slow release for us. Um, in 4.15, we got, uh, we changed a little bit how we worked before because normally all the patches we have been submitting there have been going through Bluetooth next and from there to, to net next. And now we decided that we actually pick the 1504 patches directly, but the shared system, uh, 6 open, which is shared between 15.4 and Bluetooth, that will still go through the Bluetooth tree to make sure that we are in sync there and both are keep working. Um, we got some uh, fixes for uh, the link layer encryption. Um, it was good to see that someone is actually using that and, and finding problems and fixing them. Um, the usual bug fixes for drivers. And we also got uh, support for uh, um, another USB dongle, um, the busware Huel. Sadly, I have to say, this one is not available to sale, uh, sale anymore. But it, um, it's a bit sad because that was one of the one easily gettable um, sub one gigahertz transceivers you can just use as an USB dongle. So, but you're not able to get them anymore, sadly. Um, and for 4.16, uh, we got a few more enhancements for the analog driver um, and support for new devices. So new um, chips are actually producing based on the old one or design. Um, in 4.17, uh, we got kind of a problem when, um, when Eric did the rehash table rework for fragmentations in IP version 6. Um, when his patches landed at some point, I tried and testing it again, and it completely broke how we did uh, 6 low, low pan adaptation to our um, subsystem. I will come to that later. And uh, luckily, we fixed that in time, so Alex found a fix how to get that done, and so it never came out into release or something. And we got another um, transceiver driver. Um, for the MCR20A uh, transceiver and uh, also some security fixes for one of the drivers out there. Yeah, on the 6 open side, there was even less um, work going on there. Um, there are some patches pending for um, fragmentations problems or um, for 6 open adaptations on, on the high load. I'm still waiting for um, a new patch set on that, and I want to test it out if I can actually reproduce it before I apply it. But um, the patches have been going to like one or two iterations now, and they look better, and I think that we can apply them, apply them soon. Um, one of the big things we are still missing there, which is still not tackled, is um, a user space um, interface to actually configure the header compressions. Right now, it's still just a set of modules, and if they are loaded, the header compression is enabled, and if they are not loaded, it's not. So it's really, really basic. It's nothing you can configure from an administration point of view or anything. That's something that still needs to be done. And here, as you mentioned, there is um, interest for going for different header compression techniques, different header um, schemes there. Um, there's generic header compression, which is also something that's interesting for 15.4. If you, um, it's basically interesting for upper layer protocols that reuse um, the IP addresses or the other things like routing addresses, like DTLS um, header. Um, if you start in DTLS session, you reuse uh, the IP address, or if you do like Ripple uh, information or something like that, then you can again uh, reduce the um, the bytes you're sending over because you re you just reuse what you have been done in the lower layers before. And then you have static uh, context header compression, which would be interesting for for the long range protocols. 
Um, yeah, as in, in a summary, so we, we had a bunch of updates, uh, mostly making sure that the drivers keep working, that all the fixes we are, we are seeing from people start using it more and get applied. Um, so it's mostly maintenance for the last year, basically. Um, the, the regression fix was one of the big, biggest ones, and I'm happy that we actually figured that out before the kernel release went out. Um, the big changes are stalling right now. I mean, we have a big list of things we want to work on, but that really depends on the time Alex and myself have for that. Um, there are two more things that are in progress right now on the main list being discussed and yeah, in the process of getting applied. There's the LQA value socket option. So you want to get the information about the link quality you have to the different peers you're communication with, and, and you want to get that back to the application actually sending the data out. And so there's one person who actually implemented a patch to have that as a socket option you can enable and then um, now what, what's going on there. And then in the application you can track the AQA values for the different peers you're communicating with. And then there's the hardware simulator, which is basically um, an updated version of the fake uh, loopback driver we had before. And the hardware sim is really completely modeled um, after what wireless did there. So it also will have a uh, Netlink interface. You can actually dynamically um, change edges that, that are available and stuff like that. So that makes it a lot more easier for testing. And that is actually the base for all the testing approach we will, um, I will talk later about. Um, so that is something that's important to go in. And I think we are close there. I still need to give it another review. And then we can see. So just one bonus slide, um, because that's kind of an interesting topic for myself as well. So um, it's more for people like really wanting to tinker around a bit and hack and stuff. Um, so the IKEA Tradfi system is actually based on 15.4. So they have like, they're using the Zigbee light link protocol there, and they have different light bulbs, demo buttons, remote motion sensors, and all kinds of these things, and really cheap. It's, it's IKEA in the end, so um, you get like a light bulb for like 10 Canadian dollar or so. And you can actually open it and flash it uh, without destroying it. So the ship itself has no protection or something. You can really just hook up the um, JTAG interface and flash the ship with something like RiotOS has already support for this kind of device, which means you can have like your own software running on the light bulb, talking 15.4 and 6 open and stuff like that, and maybe talking to other devices. So. I don't know how much interest that is to other people here, but for me, obviously, that's quite an interesting thing. So I need to get that set up here. Um, the controller used in this kind of IKEA devices um, is a uh, Cortex M4, but it only has like 256 kilobyte of RAM, uh, flash, and 32 kilobyte of RAM. So that's really out of scope for running Linux on it. So you really need a different operating system there. But there are open source operating systems out there that can run on it, and that's quite interesting. Okay, so I will now hand over to Alexander. Yeah, um, hi. My talk is about uh, multiple interface handling on uh, IEEE 802 15.4 file. It's uh, similar like what you know about Ethernet in Mac VLAN. Uh, interface and currently what a phi is, uh, 802.15.4 phi is, it's a device class under Linux, like, like in wireless. And on top of a phi, you can create several uh, interfaces. Currently, we support only one. It depends uh, if you're wanting. Um, in promiscuous mode. Um, so in wireless, this feature has more the the thing why it's there is that you can run multiple access points on one file. I think this is possible in wireless, and we are we have a similar infrastructure. And um, the problem is when you want to run multiple interfaces on one file is that the file has only one address filter on the transceiver and you have only one register settings to set one address which is uh, defined by the extended address, it's a MAC address, then a short address, that's a second MAC address which you can use uh, interleaved, uh, you can switch to them, and a PAN ID. A PAN ID is 
like in Ethernet a VLAN tag. So this um, the thing is when you have the address filtering on and the transceiver receives a frame and it's getting through through the address filter, then the transceiver makes an automatic acknowledging handling and transmit a, 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 um, a egg frame back according to the um, received frame. So this is more an offload feature because I, this was already know, um, mentioned that the egg handling is very time critical and this is also the problem. Um, a solution to make this is going into the promiscuous mode and promiscuous mode means disable the address filtering and then let's doing Linux the filtering on the software side. But then you disable egg, egg handling because what I told you the transceiver is um, very stupid. It, um, they have no more feature that I can say um, yeah, for this addresses, um, send an egg frame out or something. Um, the egg handling is only offloaded like this. When it's past the address filtering, then it sent a, back, um, a frame back. But we, when we go into promiscuous mode to offer that the Linux do the address filtering, then we can, um, then we need to disable egg handling. Otherwise, we egg every frame, and this will confuse a lot of the network. So, um, so there exists a feature in a transceiver, which is the AT, uh, some Admiral trans um, transceiver which we support. It is known as slot acknowledgement handling there. And this feature is more that when you receive a frame and you want to egg it, then you can trigger a pin and according the sequence number, which is inside the frame buffer, then it acts this frame. So it's very um, the speed. It just it's just um, trigger the pin on where you have the pin setting. And this uh, there is no need of um, socket buffer allocation because we don't we don't need to allocate any buffer. We just need to trigger the pin and the sequence number according to this acknowledgement frame is according to the sequence number which is inside the frame buffer. So the implementation idea is to combine this feed, the true feature, the promiscuous mode, and a, and a lookup table, a small lookup table on which addresses we want to act on the receiving part. So if we receive a frame, we need to read out the frame so far we get the um, addresses. And then we have a lookup table on which addresses we all support in our Linux stack. So if you have multiple interfaces, then these has address configuration. And, and then we run and look if we have an interface running which belongs to this address. And if this is true, then we just trigger the pin. And then um, we, send a, um, we send the act frame according to the frame out, the receive frame out. So this is, this is still a software handling. But so far, I see we can do that all in, uh, inside the hard IRQ where the hard IRQ, I mean, is the transceiver reports to the Linux kernel, A, there is a frame, and then we just doing this handling. And this feature is also possible to have this lookup table inside the AT USB firmware. That's the USB dongle, which uh, wants a special um, firmware on it. But it's um, we need to test it if we still can handle the egg timings. So the egg timings are something in IEEE standard, and they are also different according which um, frequency we use. And yeah, this, of course, when we're going into the problem source mode and doing um, address filtering on the Linux side, then 
the Linux side has more work to do. But we just, but this is a feature, somebody already requested it to have different source PAN IDs uh, and then on one file. And then you can run on each interface a six low PAN interface and then you have something like a VLAN interface. Just a quick comment to that. So that really basically boils down that we might need to think about having software fallback implementations for something like automatic uh, uh, act transmission and stuff like that. Um, that is that is one part of it. And sometimes the hardware can help us that, like the AT um, um, uh, transceiver we have there. Um, but there's also other types like the CC2520 or something. I think they have a functionality where you can read out the buffer like you can send like getting an IRQ if you have the buffer filled for like five bytes or something, then you can read it out while it's still receiving, and then you can read out and think if you want to um, transmit the ACK for that one because you can uh, look up in the table if that's correct address yeah. there. Um, so different hardware types have different support for that, but really have to look for it for every type. But there's also other things that might be problematic if you go, for example, something like beacon enabled networks. I mean, we are not really using them for six low pan, but in the spec they are available that you can have like the network sending out beacons and then the um, devices can join them. You also need to take that into account if you're running different pans on one file layer, on one file, and then make sure that you send out the correct beacons and everything. I don't know the timings for that, if they're really critical or not, but it's also something to keep in mind. So for other transceivers, um, they don't have this pin, I think, but um, yeah, we can allocate a small buffer and fill a small. I mean, it really depends. Some, the ships really have different functionalities. Yeah. For example, the one from uh, the CC one from TI has the functionality that you can say, okay, I want to get this uh, buffer, an IQ if the buffer has read in like five bytes or something, and then you do that, then you check the, the header, see if that's a correct address, then yeah. prepare the egg already, make sure that it completely receives the frame and then send out the egg immediately. I've seen a paper on that uh, on the Contiki side where they use this kind of functionality to piggyback the AQI values inside a software generated egg frame. So that is something that it is possible. I don't know if it's possible on Linux. We have to see that. But they are, depending on the hardware, sometimes it works, sometimes not. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes. Question regarding the. Here. So most of the complexity that you have mentioned with regards to hack handling that will arise only in case if the PAN ID used across multiple trans receivers is same and that the channel of those trans receivers is also same, right? Yeah, the, the, file, the file layer is the same. The file layer channel is same yeah. and the PAN ID is same because otherwise the hardware should take, uh, 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 should uh, ensure that the hack, hack uh, transmission happens properly. Yeah, the issue is here, you have only one um, address filtering on the transceiver, uh, um, the address filtering on the transceiver, and you cannot tell the transceiver that you're running two source pans. And I, I try to make that you can handle different addresses. So, so multiple. Yeah, yeah, so sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, but as I understand, yeah. the ACK would be transmitted only if the PAN ID matches. Yeah. So, so yeah. essentially, yeah. What, what I'm trying this to understand the rationale why anyone would have multiple trans receivers on the same PAN ID in the same channel. I mean, that, that, is, uh, that is as if... That is, um, I got this request for this feature from some Ripple guy, uh, Ma Michael Richardson, he's on the mailing list. Oh, also. MCR, okay. Yeah, Michael. And he wanted to have, he wants to route between two PANs, and th that was the use case for him. Okay. And... Uh, yeah, and then you can possible if you have two um, Mac interfaces on one file, and then you set up a six loop end interface on each of them, and then you can make some weird setups like this. Okay. Okay. Oh, one, one but more you question. can also use two transceivers. That's also <laughs> possible. <laughs> but yeah, uh, just j just uh, uh, maybe Michael will be able to. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I you can. Uh, yeah. No, he's not. He's not here. Uh, no. He will be there in ITF anyways. Uh, so another question. Uh, I'm not sure if it is yeah. in the same context, but 
the rdc or the radio duty cycling is something that has been missing as part of this implementation we, we are we are actively making use of this implementation there are several issues that we have fixed as of now in this implementation uh, one which recently i think uh, we have uh, mentioned on the mailing list regarding the uh, problem of removing the frame check sequence fcs two bytes uh, frame check, uh, check sequence i think you re replied back one of my team members had uh, uh, mailed on the mailing list okay. so so what i'm trying to say is uh, m more more most of the implementation is working but one of the key part which is the radio duty cycling is missing mm. and is there any is there any scope or is there any plan i, I know lot, there's a lot on the table already <laughs> but is there any from my side at least i have not really thought much about radio duty cycling work on that regard so if you have anyone implementing stuff there and have interest in getting that in i mean we are always open to get patches there and we, we are happy to review stuff so at least on my side i'm not planning on doing implementations there and i don't know if alex had but from his look on his face i think he's not planning on doing that you you have any plans to doing radio duty cycling work or and there exists some software ready dirty cycling from Contiki, but this is also not 802.15.4 specific. So people running into issues because this is used out of the box. And then I say, no, you need to disable that. And then, yeah, but they losing then more low power feature and such things. Um, but we don't support this right now. I, we, from Contiki side, I'm not more involved with the Contiki community, but more with the Wired OS. And the Wired OS people, they also don't support this Contiki yeah, yeah. Uh, radio dirty cycle. But I can imagine that send patches and then. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the problems that, you know, uh, RDC is not standardized. Not yeah. ITP yeah, is not standardized. ITF cannot standardized. standardized then, uh, oh. We can then for sure, but uh, I don't know if you have any policy if you want to have. I mean, it, it really depends on if there's a real need for it. I mean, I'm not really blocking things. I mean, I'm, I'm always skeptical if there's just one use case for a specific thing, and I don't really want to have all the maintenance of these kind of things I don't really have interest in or any, any use cases for. Um, but if you bring it up on the list and, and describe why you're having it and what kind of implementation you did, and if you can make sure that it's not really in the way for others, then we can see maybe have a way for getting that in. But I really need to look into into what you did there and what is actually the the downside and what's the advantage there. So, but um, on one other thing you mentioned, so you you said that you found different gaps in the implementation, which is obviously there. We have a lot of them. I, I know that. But it would be really good and interesting for us to get feedback and input in what kind of use case you have for it, what you're using it for, and what is missing, because um, we both use it mostly for well just toying around with it, playing, but it's not like in real um, company use case or some commercial use case or anything for that. So obviously we are not uh, having the right priorities sometimes. So ha getting input from, from other people using it might actually help us to schedule our resources the right way to actually get that way. So if you have anything like that, drop a, list, a mail on the list or drop it to me and Alex or something, that would really help. Sure, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, my next talk, uh, it's about some, um, yeah, I talked a little bit about this already uh, last NetDev in Montreal. So um, it's about getting header information from IPv6 socket layer. So it sounds weird, but there exist, the ITF makes protocols. Currently, for example, in 802.15.4, there's a mesh link establishment protocol which I know I'm aware of it. And this protocol uh, works on top of UDP layer. And then what, um, what this protocol needs is to some MAC header information in receiving part, um, which you cannot get currently from, from a Linux IPv6 UDP socket. And also, if you want to do something in neighbor discovery, I think the most st stuff is that I think there are also some um, features for compression and decompression, which they don't want to send twice. And then you can reconstruct such data from the MAC header, 
but here are some thoughts about what, uh, how to tackle this issue because currently there, there are people who are asking for such feature because they wanted to implement something like mesh link establishment protocol and yeah yeah this is this the, the question is how we to get them per message this is this is really according uh, per message so when you run your system call receive message and you want to get some yeah how was the mac header look like for specific attributes like what was the um, MAC address which was used and also in 802.15.4 we have a flow control field which indicates if security is enabled or not and this is also needed in in this on top of this uh, layer. So people usually working this around by if you use stateless auto configuration then you can reconstruct your link layer address from layer 3. I, I already saw such code, but this is not was, what the RFC is telling you. The RFC is telling you get this method and the, this information from the MAC header. And yeah, I'm worried about that there are special cases where it doesn't work anymore because the address which is used is not from um, it's not it's not our stateless auto configuration address for example when they when they is based on the MAC address and um, yeah the solution which I already thought about and also Michael Richardson from ITF he wanted also this feature um, to ha put this into the control message in. Uh, information. So for re receive message and send message you have some ancillary data. Uh, this is for some fields like hop limit, IPv6 hop limit is a, um, you can ask this, um, what was the hop limit of um, the IPv6 header when you get a message on top of UDP. And also these uh, attributes, they are arc are actually defined by a technical RFC. I don't know which number again, but IPv6 hop limit sub, sub stuff is specified by the ITF. How they look at how they look at at a BSD socket interface. So um, if we add our our own stuff, then everything gets very Linux specific, because then you cannot port anymore. Other, soft, uh, other software to Riot OS or Contiki when they're using the same socket layer. Uh, I already heard they uh, implement, they want to get rid of the BSD socket um, and want to make some own. And um, yeah, I thought when we implement something like that, then we can also submit some technical RFC. If somebody, I never did that, but uh, if we want to do, do that, maybe we can start some d discussion on the six low working mailing, uh, mailing list. Somebody replied there. And there's another problem also, how to get this information from the six low pan layer up to the UDP socket layer. And because, um, you know, the socket buffer is very strict according um, that it fits into uh, cache line and something we, we cannot simply add more and more metadata otherwise um, yeah it's uh, it's getting too full and yeah um, other solution because recently there was somebody on the mailing list and on a chat um, he thought, yeah, when I go to the promiscuous mode and open a RF packet raw socket, then I get the the MAC header information in the payload. But this is not true because our six low pan interface is more a raw IPv6 interface after the six low pan adaptation. So we we remove completely the uh, the MAC header information. So it looks like on the Bluetooth side. 
and on the 800 side, it looks the same. And um, th this is not how, how it works. It, it was always like this. And um, also on send, this also um, solved the problem on receive message, but when, what is when send message? When you want to say on top of uh, IPv6 UDP socket, you want to say, please use a short address instead of an extended address. Um, or enable, f don't enable the security field on this specific IPv6 packet. Um, you cannot tell this over this solution. That's more somebody thought that would work like this, but send message is you need to have some fields. Then that's uh, what the people want, and. Yeah, and also on this WACFAR message, if we put the IEEE 802.54 frame and then a raw IPv6 frame, this is ATA not defined at all, we can put a raw IPv6 dispatch value on a 6 low pan. Um, the 6 low pan specification, they said um, special dispatch value, this is compression according some standard, but you can also say this is our raw IPv6 packet which is not compressed. This can we can work around this like this, but this is also the, that sounds more like a hack, and we should not change this behavior. I think. Um, what the user really want is on top of UDP and ICPv6 sockets. They want to have this as a control message field, to, so they can simply say for this. Um, IPv6 message, um, please use this, this mess, uh, MAC header information or uh, receive this me, me, um, MAC header information. But there's also a question according fragmentation because when you realize when you run fragmentation, you have multiple MAC information and which um, then the MAC in information are mostly the same for addresses. It need to be the same, but there, I don't know if when there is a field and the fragmentation, and when the when we receive a IPv6 header which uh, belongs to more fragments, which header information, then these MAC header information need all to be the same on all frag fragments. So, yeah, we need some way to offer this over C message data uh, in an upstream acceptable solution. So not just putting it into the SKB buffer and then uh, get it from there. I think this was my hack in uh, in my thesis. Uh, but um, there exists some SKB hash metadata in the socket buffer, and I think we can we can at least identify the SKB buffer from the 6 lupin layer again on the UDP socket layer, for example. And according to this hash value on the receiving side and transmit side, we can um, identify them through the, um, through the layers. And yeah, maybe that's the solution, And but again, this I, I would like to welcome to have a solution that we come close close with other operating system um, together on a socket layer. So not I know that Contiki and WideOS everything is they don't have a separation between kernel and user space. They just get this information somehow on some <laughs> different way. But we are we we want to have an API for this in the current socket interface API. And there are also existing already um, metadata in the SKB, like Wi-Fi Act. This is, for example, we, this is wireless has a feature for that to check if this IP header was act or not. And we can simply use it because we are not wi wireless. We can simply use the same fields. But we don't do that right now. But I think it would be a small patch to do that. 
And I think you can get this information from the socket error queue. And there's, there's something. Yeah, and this was all. Now I gave. Any questions on this part before we switch to the next one? Okay. So we have like 10 minutes left, so we'll speed up a little bit here. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the workshop, we had the situation where um, there was this rework on the IP version 6 fragmentation handling, and that really hit us hard um, because we didn't know what happened there and why our complete six low pens stopped working for us. Um, Good Bisect helped us to find it, and then we finally figured out that it was a problem with the edo size we have in our, um, in our Mac layer here. Um, which is completely different from Ethernet, so that means we have the problem here that the struct did not have the right bytes padded, and then we had some some random bytes in there, and that might cause problems in some situations, some not. So Alex found a fix for that, and we um, got it applied, and that that's all good. But anyway, th so that all triggered um, some thoughts about how we do testing, and especially do testing in a way for people that, like Eric, who do a lot of work on the TCP stack, but definitely have no interest in 15.4, and I completely understand that, and, but they should have a way to actually easily test their rework um, without getting involved and having hardware and setting it up in uh, a complicated way. So um, Alex's work on hardware simulator is one step in this direction, so that we have a way to actually emulate the hardware so don't, people don't have to have it, and we can do it in a controlled environment. We can add this kind, this, this, as many devices as we want. We can add as many edges between the device and so on. And um, if we can get started with that, then we can go ahead and use something like K-self test and have our own test suite based on that. So um, that would actually help two sides here. One, for example, the situation we have for people like Eric doing huge reworks in the stack and want to check that everything works, but also for me when I'm applying patches or something, I want to make sure that everything works, and right now my test setup always involves real hardware and stuff like that. That is also slow and annoying at some points. For example, when like now when I'm traveling, I'm not able to actually, I mean, I'm able to review patches, but I'm not able to test them. So if I have a way to actually really emulate that in a, in a just software way, that really would help me as well. Um, so that is the direction we want to go in. And um, yeah, so the first steps are like the hardware simulator driver that is in progress right now. As I said, really similar to the one from wireless, all the concepts and ideas and even some code is copied from there. Um, so we can emulate a whole stack running 15.4 and 6.0 pen on that. That is um, working quite fine, actually. Um, and it's easy for people without the hardware or even interest to test it. So hooking that all up to K-self-test um, gives us a way for easy regression testing or even testing for new patches coming in. Um, it's also helpful if doing a, a bigger network stack rework, as I said. Um, so the basic things I wanted to see in there and the things I will be working on, I mean, I can't really give a time frame for that, but that's something I, I want to work on definitely. Um, it's like having different frame sizes, having different, in 15.4, having different frame sizes for 6 low pan, making sure that different header compressions are enabled and all. Uh, on and off and so on. So can we can see that all the different permutations of things we have right now is working. I mean, that's really only a subset of what is possible, but that's a subset we have right now, and we want to make sure that that is actually tested. Um, from that one, later on, we can go in, in more advanced testing. So um, there's Scapy, that's a Python-based user space networking toolbox, basically. I can do a lot of things there, and uh, I have an implementation for 15.4 for the uh, file layer that is actually hooked into that, and I was able to send out package over that. So you can really, like, programmatically um, do your own package, make sure that what kind of uh, frames you have, what kind of uh, fields of the frames are actually set, what kind of bits are set, what kind of payload you put in, and you can, you can do a lot of things. Like, you can do security research, you can also do just pack, uh, network stack testing and stuff like that. Um, so there's something interesting in there. If Scapy is really the way for us in the end to go, I don't know yet, but it's an interesting project nevertheless. So I really need to dust up all the implementations I have, clean it up, and, and send it upstream. 
And then there's also uh, Titan, which is like TTCN3. That's a, a testing language and framework. Um, Harald Welter mentioned it or talked about it last NetDev in Seoul. Um, so this is really something for a bit more of a cl complex protocol stack you want to test. You have different options. I mean, TTCN is really a language designed for network testing in that case. So that might be another option for actually for us testing it. I had the hope that I actually could do some testing with uh, 15.4 on it, but I didn't really manage before the conference. Sorry for that. So if you hope for implement, uh, so details on that part, I had to say sadly that's not possible. Um, yeah, so if you combine this kind of things, so the first steps I mentioned is K-self test as the first and easy step, and then the advanced testing, that is something I see more that something myself or Alex will run more like regularly or something, or other people that are interested in that definitely can run it as well, but that's not, at least the way I see it, that's not part of the kernel, because that might be too complicated in the end. I mean, I might be wrong there, we have Python scripts already, but I don't know how easy it is to get something like a dependency on Scapy or Titan into the kernel for that, but that's something to have to bring up. I mean, I'm, I'm really new to K-self-test myself, so I don't know what, what kind of dependencies they accept and what not, and how we do that, but um, the first thing is that is something we can, we can do easily. Okay. So, before we go to, to the rest here, any questions on, on the testing side? Any suggestions? Because, yeah. um, go ahead, if you have to enable it. Yeah, um, the big advantage in HW Simulator is that you can get, create a multi-hop network that was not possible before with fake LB. Uh, in this very yeah, um, you have you have a multi-hop, but also you can enable during runtime. Add yeah, you can run devices which was not yeah, possible. Yeah, you can um, for. delete file um, file connections and add file connections. You can change the topology on the file layer, what you want. And what was possible also with fake LB is uh, if you want a monitor interface, you and then wire it in user space or open thread in user space, and then you have a Linux to wire it in user space. So completely, that's completely um, test against other stacks without any hardware. Yeah, I mean, that is something I, I didn't bring that up here because um, I didn't see that as part of the first steps because I really want to keep that simple to make sure that we have something inside the kernel we can just run there with KSELF test. But as you, as you said, I mean, later on for the more complex scenarios that might be interesting to also have different software stacks running on that. But that always means that you have a more complex setup on your work machine to actually get that working. And that is not really easily duplicatable for others. So. Okay, any more questions or comments on the, on the testing part here? I mean, besides do more testing? No? Okay. Okay, we come to the last topic here. Um, things we, we want to do in the future, we want to get input in, and um, yeah, as I mentioned a few times during the thing, um, there's a bunch of things we know that have gaps that we might need to fill, um, that there's work to do that was on the table, but we are just simply not, not coming to it. Um, I mean, I just, I just got a parent a few months ago, so that means my time is also limited. Alex moved countries and has a full-time job now, not being a student anymore, so that's really making problems for, for the timing here. But we are still interested and we want to keep that forward. But yeah, just to explain it. So the one of the biggest things we have to work on is, is HardMac. I mentioned that before. Um, there's the CC, uh, CA8210 um, transceiver. There's also the XB transceivers, which nowadays could be used together with, with the SERDEV, which was merged in mainline for like a few kernel releases back or something. So you can bring up a driver for that in a more easy fashion because that's using a UART protocol and you can bring that in with the other. So that might be another thing that's interesting here. And with, with these two drivers, we really need to find a way to find a good hardware, hard Mac extraction, then we can put it into the, into the file layer for us. Um, header compressions, as I mentioned before, um, gen generic header compressions and the static context header compressions are the ones that I think are most interesting to work on. Um, I have some code sitting in a branch, which is most likely very outdated, for generic header compression. I think it was only for 
I don't know if it was compression or decompression, one side I had working and not the other one. So that's something also to dust off and, and work on. Um, if there's someone working on the uh, static context, I'm really happy to, to get any input on that. Um, then there's the request we got to having like uh, the transmit power mode setting for send message. That's also something coming from MCR. Um, he wanted to have that to probe networks, uh, to probe nodes, how far they are away, so can, he can make routing decisions in his Ripple implementation to actually decide um, how much of a power budget it would burn if you go through this node to the other one. So that's something interesting for him. I don't know if it's interesting for others, but that's something we, we also need to think and talk about. Um, and he also mentions a few times by now that there are the software fallback implementations for Egg, Egg handling, frame retries, and maybe even C uh, CSMA handling. But um, I really have to do the math and get the, the timing requirements from the specifications and figure out if that's possible or not, and if it's possible, how good we can actually match these requirements. I mean, it always depends on the um, on the box you're running it, if you're using something like real-time patch set on top of the kernel or not. It, that's a lot of things getting involved there. And one of the things I'm always a bit reluctant uh, to, to work on and making a final decision on are the user space interfaces, because everything else we can easily change and, and change around and, and fix later up. Um, but the things we expose to user space are always the things we are mostly setting in stone, and I'm not a big fan of redoing user space interface after a year or something, just because we did it wrong in the first place. Um, so there is need for uh, the configuration options for the different header compression schemes. And you can to enable the modules, uh, disable them, enable them, um, making sure that they are running per node or in general or something. So there are different things. So um, my first choice would be Netlink in that case. Um, others suggested this effect, but I'm really not a big fan of that kind of thing for, for configuration for, for this type. I mean, it's not a one-off configuration. It's more like you really make sure that it is always running for this kind of node, then you're updating it and so on. So doing it on this, I don't know if that's the best choice. If there are other alternatives, I would be happy to hear about it. So um, then we have more uh, things to be exposed um, for the root over or mesh under protocols, mostly Ripple or other mesh implementations. Um, the AQI information we mentioned before, um, getting them out with the, over the socket layer is one of the things here. And I looked at the patch again today, and I'm quite happy with it. So that might be something, the one of the first things we do for the user space improvement here. Um, also, the RX in receive, met receive method and the transmit power in send message, that is something we haven't really done code for yet. That's just a request we got from, from uh, MCR. And source root is something he also requested, but I think he, I talked to him when I was uh, trying to figure out if he would be able to, for him to come here, but um, I think he never tried out the source route and segment uh, routes and some the suggestions he got the last year in Montreal. So that would be the first thing he ha actually has to do before we do any more implementations on that part. Um, so that is the user space interfaces I'm aware of that we need to do. I'm happy to hear about more or different use cases you have. Um, so yeah, okay, that is the bonus slides, and I don't think we're able to come to that. So we have a few minutes over time, but I'm still, we still think we have like for two or more questions also. If you have any, go ahead. Yeah. I think uh, what's important to do is maybe that we can support this stuff but outside. So that's what the people want when they hear about open thread. Then they want to run open thread, but there there are different people who want wants Linux support maybe only to run a user space stack in open thread. So the you're running open thread as an application, that's a thread implementation which is open source and then you can can run this as user space stack, but this is not the goal. What we want to do, we we want to offer this as a socket API. But I get, I have the opinion, much people. This is of course more more work, but on the mailing list, I see a lot of people they they want to so have this. I think in in terms of 15.4, thread got a lot of momentum because I mean they don't only have a solution for 15.4 for the basic 
building blocks, but for a whole stack. The thing is that um, for us to support it, I mean, um, I talked to the Nest guys and they have their own vision how they want to implement it. And that is how they're doing it right now. And Linux is only, um, the only part they would be interested in from our side would be the drivers and file layer and everything on top of that they want to control on their own, which is fair. I mean, that's their own choice how, to, how they want to do that. For us, it's different. I mean, we always wanted to have all the building, the parts of the stack enhanced to actually run um, something like MLE on top on, on things like that. But I mean, if there's no interest from people coming in, we really have to, to figure out what kind of resources we put somewhere. So that is why I wanted to get input and see what kind of people want to have and want to use, and then we can make priorities based on that. I mean, um, I, I still would really happily run a uh, run thread on top of our stack. Yeah, but I'm, I'm fine so far. We we are close with the Riot community, I think, and if they, at least we support that that what we they support, <laughs> it's uh, we are in a good shape. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they okay. keep advancing. <laughs> okay. So, any more questions? from the audience here. There you go. Finally. A any any chance of Ripple integration here? I mean, uh, the workshop <laughs> title was uh, Routing Protocol as well, so I was hoping. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that, is, <laughs> that was the title from the one from last year, so I, I kept it over. And the last, I still hoped until a few months ago that uh, MCR will be here, but then he told me that he couldn't make it. So um, he would be the guy talking about the Ripple side. So I mean, um, from our side, we are not really touching it. We, we, what we do is like we want to provide all the infrastructure on the stack to do that. And I still hope we can do the Ripple part on, on the user space. So be it unstrung, be it something else. Um, but we really not doing the work on doing the routing, routing implementation here. So, um, but all the requirements we get for that, we try to find a way to actually to do that so we can get an implementation out of that. But yeah. Yes, actually, um, the the unstrung thing is more complicated because the the IPv6 stack it also drops a lot of thing out of the box when there's a option field in the IP options which they don't know. There's recently, I think, Tom Herbert added it a sysfs control field to allow some more option field, but unstrung is do don't set it. The user need to be aware of it, yeah, and, I mean, but, but and there's a lot, lot of things that are missing, and um, you need to be more a Ripple expert <laughs> to get something running there at the moment. But uh, yeah, we need to tackle these issues. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, Michael didn't really have time either to work on it. I mean, the, I, that is a sad reality, basically, um, that he knows about a few things he wants to implement there, a few of the feedback he got on the last time we also have been in Montreal, some of the features he's waiting on is from our side, that's, that we actually implement them, um, but also things like Alex mentioned, there, this is an option to actually enable some, some options for the kernel um, to make sure that they are working correctly, because there, was an, there have been patches for that, but I think the, the one applied now from, from Tom. I don't know. Anyway, so there is there's an option now to actually disable that, so a Ripple uh, unstrung can run again. But yeah, so um, I mean, there was this one kernel implementations for Ripple, but this person never really came back to me and never really wanted to do any work on that anymore. So um, and I personally think that user space would be the, the better place for it. So I just think that unstrung is a bit of a I mean, Michael tries to bring it forward, but it's really just his, his toy project, basically, as well. So, uh, so just one comment here. So it's it, yeah. it's not only about the Ripple implementation, but the the interfaces. For example, in case of Ripple, there are yeah. some changes which are required to the routing pro uh, routing table itself. For example, keeping some additional fields. So that is something. Mm, uh, I, 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 I mean, yeah, it's not only about the Ripple. Implementation. Okay. Okay. So so okay. Yeah, that, that that's something um, we really talked about the uh, case to case basis. So. Um, for routing stuff, that will be a bit harder for Alex and myself to do because we are not that much into the complete core of the networking stack. So, but we can bring it up on the list. We can do implementation and stuff like that. But um, yeah, we need to get the information what is actually needed for that. And that is normally what I rely on for Michael to actually get his input for what he needs there for the implementation. Okay, so I think we are over time by 10 minutes now, so I should stop. And um, thank you all, and have a good day. <laughs>